I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcast, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Casey Parks. Advocatus Maximus is back on the show today, mainly because I've been wanting to talk about this subject, but also because our life is in chaos and uh, I needed his help. Hi, Casey. Hi, darling. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're back on the podcast. And I think a lot of other dads will be too, who are tuning in. So thanks for being here. Yeah, it's been too long. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Life in 2022, I feel has been like a pretty stressful time for us. How's it going for you? <laughs> yes, I think that's a that's a pretty fair description of how 2022 has gone. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know you, Casey, can you tell them about your career and what it takes for you to like mentally show up for that alongside being a dad? Yeah, sure. So I am a senior deputy prosecuting attorney for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Basically means I'm the guy asking a jury to convict criminals uh, of various whatever crime they've committed. I currently work in our domestic violence unit, so I deal a lot with people that have abused their intimate partners and dealing with pretty serious crimes, pretty serious assaults for the most part, and other uh, the other crimes you'd expect in a domestic violence situation. Kind of unsurprisingly, you know, that's like I think most jobs that uh, that are worth doing are it takes a toll. You know, I'm, I'm engaging with a lot of people who have gone through some really, really awful stuff. And you have to be present for that. You have to be emotionally committed. And so yeah, it's, it's a pretty high stress quotient uh, for that job. And, uh, but I love it. It's what I went to law school to do. And yeah, so coming home from that can, I, I have to get in a very specific mental uh, just kind of headspace in order to turn that off, uh, to disengage from what I need to do to to be in trial all day, and then come home and be here for for everybody. You know, you get home and there's Ford, and he is always so excited to see me, and and Esme who's immediately running around and wants to play and wants to do play-doh and wants to do slime and wants to watch a show and wants to play tag and would like to do all of those things at the same time and then there's you know there's you and you've been taking care of these kids all day and i need to be present for you too that's a that's something that's really important to me and i'm sure i don't always succeed at it but it just requires uh, an, an intentional slowing down and disconnect from work and it's hard to do mm. i'm mildly envious of your commute home uh, your commute home is usually like what 40 minutes in the car to yourself yeah it's about right and uh and yeah i use that time uh that's kind of the time that i use to to switch mental gears from work to <laughs> to getting ready for uh for home yeah I don't know how it is for other families so much, but I know I feel like most of the time, you know, I'm home with the kids all day. It's wild, wild west. I'm running around. I'm trying to get work done. You know, I'm doing all the household chores and all the Ford chores and also make memories, you know, with the kids. But then I'm like, oh, my gosh, Casey's coming home and I am just going to let him take care of this because I'm done. And I know that's not necessarily fair to anyone and it doesn't really make sense, but it's almost like 
finally my respite is home, even though I know you're just coming off from another job. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that reminds me, that's something that uh, Ezzy has been saying a lot recently is that's not fair. <laughs> and <laughs> that has been irking my, my, my logical side, my uh, non three-year-old side uh, that uh, where I'm sitting there going, you know what, it, it doesn't matter whether or not it's fair. Life isn't always fair. Uh, and, and what's important is, yes, obviously try to be fair to others. But when life isn't fair to you, you just take it in stride and do the best you can with the situation. Because the reality is, it's not fair to you uh, that you've been dealing with that all day. Um, and I think you're very nice, but um, talking about dealing with the kids all day and making memories with them, I think downplays everything you do because yes that's a huge commitment a full-time job and it is hard it is hard to be a stay-at-home mom period uh but then to be a stay-at-home mom uh for a rare disease kiddo and a, a non-rare disease kiddo that's a full-time job in and of itself but you know you always you also do that thing where you run this uh award-winning podcast and then you're an advocate in the community generally and you also speak at events and you have like four full-time jobs and you're a badass at all of them um and it's a huge commitment it's a huge commitment to you and it's not fair to you that you don't have a time to to decompress so so yes it's not fair that when i come home i need to take over sometimes um but i'm not worried about whether or not it's fair i'm worried about making our family work and making our lives work and making sure that we are all as happy as we can be. Mm. Well, you're very sweet. Thank you, sweetie. You know, you said something about uh, me being a badass. Uh, no, but me being good at all of those things, which I don't necessarily agree with. And I wonder if you feel the same about your job. Do you feel like you're just killing it at home and killing it at work? Or does everything just get pretty spread thin and you don't feel like you're doing a good job anywhere because that's where I am right now. I feel like I'm just not doing a good job anywhere. There are days. <laughs> there are days when I'm staring at a computer uh, and I'm trying to make myself do the grunt work that's necessary for to be an effective trial attorney. You know, just writing briefs and sending out subpoenas and reviewing warrants and every other thing under the sun, trying to do all of those things. And it's just hard to focus because I'm, I'm just burned out. And the same thing when I get, a, get home. There are days when I am short <laughs> and I hate it when I realize that I'm being short with, uh, with any of you three. So, yeah, there are times when I do not feel like I'm doing a good job at anything. But I'll also say that's one of the reasons that I like trial. Trial is incredibly stressful but there's no choice but to be present <laughs> you're there you're in it it's it's an adrenaline spike and it it'll wear you out but it is fun because you are on the ride and you are engaged and it engages your mind and i rarely feel uh burned out during the actual time that i'm in trial it makes it harder coming home and uh and maintaining that level of commitment that I need to at home. Uh, but you get that sense of fulfillment of doing some really good work. Uh, so, so yes, uh, there are days that I feel um, like I'm not doing a good job, but there are also days that I feel really good about what I'm doing. Mm. I love that you said that about work. It's almost like that that idea of remembering who you are, right? We talk about that a lot, about what you were good at and what kind of filled you up before the stress of parenting and all the things. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that you still get that and you don't feel necessarily, or do you, do you feel super obligated and kind of run down that you're our breadwinner and that you're the one who has to like make our money and provide our health insurance like how does that compare to being able to get away and sort of take a break from the stress of our our home life yes that's something that i i feel especially living in the the greater seattle area you know i i make a good living as as a prosecutor but making a good living isn't really enough 
uh, in the greater Seattle area to do what you want. You know, we still live in a pretty small condo. Uh, haven't been able to move into the house that we we really need for Esme and Ford uh, to give them more space, to give them uh, a little bit of freedom. And that, yeah, that that weighs on me. That's something that I want to be able to do for them and for you. But at the same time, I, I do the work that I do for for very specific reasons. I didn't become an attorney until pretty late in life. I didn't go to law school until I was about 29, I think. That's when I started, or I guess 28. Uh, so, and most of the kids that were there uh, in law school with me were 23 or so. So I got into it late, but I did that because I didn't realize that's what I wanted to do until later in life. And I took a step back and figured out what it was that I wanted to do. And helping people in the criminal justice context is, is what I decided I wanted to do. Helping people that have been hurt find justice. Holding people that have decided to hurt other people accountable is what I wanted to do. So yes, I absolutely uh, have some a piece of that that weighs on me that I don't have, that I'm not making uh, as much money as I possibly could out there, that I'm not able to um, provide everything that I want for my family. Uh, and I think about that a lot, but at the same time, what I'm doing, I'm doing for a reason. And that helps, uh, that term that you like to use, it helps fill my cup. So I am able to maintain who I am, and I am able to maintain a healthier perspective and feel more fulfilled as a person. Um, and that allows me to be more connected. That allows me to continue to be me in the way that not only I want, but that the three of you need. Um, to play with Ezzy with all my little heart and to go on walks with Ford and uh, take him by the fire station to watch the garage doors open and close uh, as many times as he wants when I, when I can get home in time to do it. And to to make you a delicious steak and well, maybe a margarita when I get home. So I do like both of those things. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I have had to pick up my margarita and steak game since I met <laughs> you. There's no question. Oh my gosh. What, what's been the biggest surprise that you've discovered about yourself in the last couple of years being, being a rare dad? And maybe what are you good at? that you didn't expect? Or maybe what are you bad at that you thought you'd be better at? I'm going to say uh, both are the same thing. Um, patience. Uh, the amount of patience that is required to deal with to deal with a lot of the things that we do as rare disease parents, um, the repetitive stuff, the, the same issues that we deal with over and over and over again, um, Ford banging his head on his crib, or, you know, some of the puking stuff, all of that, or his, his just behaviors that he has difficulty controlling that aren't really his fault, that are just part of his, his package, require unreal amounts of patience. Uh, I say unreal because it was unreal to me uh, when, I, when I started to realize the, the level of patience that you need on this journey. Uh, and realizing that I did not have that level of patience. <laughs> that, 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 that is not in me, or at least it wasn't. And so that's the, the shortcomings that I, I think were surprising to me, is realizing that, man, I'd never felt impatient before. And the, the good side of it is that I have become a lot more patient than I ever thought that I could. Uh, and that's transitioned into uh, other parts of my life as well. Yeah. You definitely seem like this life is easier for you than it is for me. And I had lots of patience, I think, before. And it seems to me like you just can wrap your head around stressful situations more quickly than I can. And I don't know <laughs> why that is. If I just know that you can like take care of things when I'm like not, or if that's just like a 
dad dude thing, like jumping in to save the day? <laughs> uh, I think maybe a little bit. That's also dealing with stressful situations and keeping a cool head. Like that's trial work. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. Uh, that is, that is stressful. So I have a lot of practice at that, but there are absolutely nights where something just goes haywire. We have just finally gotten Ford down to bed and, and then we hear him throwing up. Uh, and it's just re-engaging and uh, we have to go change the sheets and get him clean and uh, whatever it was we're doing is canceled until we can get him taken care of. And there are nights that I am not the one who responds calmly to that. <laughs> <laughs> there are nights that you are the one that reminds me that the world is not on fire, <laughs> that this is going to be fine. And we just need to uh, do it calmly. So I actually think that we balance each other out pretty nicely. There are nights when I'm the calm one. There are nights where you're the calm one. And I think we do a pretty good job of, of balancing the other out when the other needs it. Because we both do at times. And I think probably everybody does. Yeah, that you, that's a good point. I do feel like we've always kind of had the lines of communication open for what we can handle and what we can't handle. Yep. And that's been, I mean, I don't know how you could do it without it. Even just the other day, like I was having a mental breakdown and I texted you and I was like, hey, I know you have a super serious job and people are counting on you, but I need you home as soon as possible. And you just said, great, thanks for telling me. Boop, boop, boop. I'll be home in two hours. Yeah. Yeah, I got that uh, text while I was sitting in court. We were going through some sentencing on some pretty serious uh, issues. And uh, we had a little break for a few minutes. So I, I typed out that text and I realized as I was doing it that I was sending it in lawyer voice. Um, <laughs> I was like, ah, I'm sure I will understand. <laughs> well, I did. I did catch it because you know, it was very businesslike. But then I was like, oh, I'm so glad he just didn't ask me why. What's going on, sweetie? Because like that would have just made me even more emotional than I already was. And I love that you just took what I said and uh, directed it to where it needed to be. And it was just like it was exactly what I needed, actually. Yeah. So unfortunately, as soon as I was done with those, uh, there's always more work to do. People, other coworkers and um, other people always ask how I manage time and that sort of thing. And uh, one of my primary answers to that is uh, this job, and I think a lot of jobs out there, will take as much time as you are willing to give it. And on that day, I didn't need to stay. I didn't need to stay and do things that I could do the next morning when I come into work. Uh, and it was more important to close my computer and get home to you on a day where things were not going good. Uh, that was far more important to me. And, um, and fortunately, people at my workplace are, uh, are really understanding about that sort of thing. And I was able to do that. So I just closed it down, came home and, and took care of things. Yeah. What do you think are some of your healthy and not so healthy coping skills that you use in your own mental health journey? realizing when I need a break and I try and be pretty good about communicating that to you and just letting you know that I need a minute. Um, I try and get together with my friends every, every once in a while or once a month or so. And we all just play nerdy games at, uh, for a night. And that's important for me. Um, I, try and take a break in the middle of the day and just walk across the street and get outside and grab something to eat. Or if I brought lunch that day, then I try and go get a cup of coffee or something like that, just so I can get up and, and get moving, not just sit at the desk all day long. Uh, I think that's probably some healthy stuff, unhealthy stuff. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll sit there and I will just, uh, on some of those occasions when I, take a break, I will uh, veg out and I will eat too many potato chips. Uh, and I will eat um, other various unhealthy stuff 
uh, and just kind of be a couch potato when I should really probably use some of that time to get up and uh, and maybe exercise or do something like that. But I'm just kind of burned out and I sit there and I often just stare at my phone. And I don't think that's healthy and I don't think it uh, really maximizes the use of, of kind of our really important time capital. But man, sometimes I just feel like that's all I got. That's all I got left. It's potato chips and a phone. <laughs> so um, that's, yeah, kind of two sides of that same coin. Yeah. You know, I know for whatever reason, you're shy, you are a highly acclaimed introvert, but I know you don't like personally connect with other rare dads as much as like, I wish you would. Mm -hmm. um, but do you listen to their stories? Are you reading their posts? Does that help you in any way? Have you ever felt like maybe you would have a shift in your engagement with this community I know you feel connected to people like Daniel because, you know, I talk about Daniel all the time, but like, do you think that it would help you to actually do this, to actually talk to these guys or like build relationships or even be, be more than a weird, creepy lurker? <laughs> uh, I do. I do use social media for weird, creepy lurking. Um, I just kind of read posts. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I think that the way that I am and the way that I've always functioned is friendships kind of have to happen organically for me. I, I'm not the kind of social butterfly where I'm going to go out and I'm going to introduce myself to people because I want to be their friend. Uh, that's just not the way my mind works. And, uh, and it is not something that is helpful for me or I think for, for the person that I'm trying to be friends with. Uh, but if it happens organically and, and I meet somebody and we're, when we do become friends, then yeah, I think that having that presence in my life is, uh, is probably good to, to kind of, you know, uh, just have that sense of connection and have that there. But I'm also pretty good at, at kind of internalizing that I'm not alone in this, uh, that there are other people that go through uh, the same or similar things that we do. And, and I feel pretty good about who I am and about what we do. Um, and I, I can, uh, what we do as parents, and that is enough for me. So obviously, I think the more connection and the more uh, friends that you have, uh, especially friends that can empathize and can connect with you on a deeper level, the more you have of that in your life, the better. But it's not something that I need in the same way that that you need it, um, because you absolutely do. Um, there's there's no question. That's something that has to be a part of your life. Um, I've seen that. It's been apparent, and I think that's a lot uh, a lot of other people. Uh, function in that way. And I think it's just kind of about understanding who you are um, and understanding uh, what you need and working to make this this life work for you. Oh, Casey. <laughs> what do you want for the next year? I know like we we kind of failed on planning anything just because the overwhelm of like trying to make anything work mm -hmm. gets in the way sometimes. Uh, like trips and packing and f flying or driving and do we have help? Yeah. But what do you hope that maybe we get checked off our bucket list this year in in whatever area? Like, what do you want us to like really focus on to get better at as as a team? Besides all the things that we really have to get better at. All the things, yeah. I think something that would be a, a, a continuing ongoing goal for us that we are going to be working on for, for our entire lives as our duties and requirements as rare disease parents continue to shift as Ford grows older. Um, but I think something that's really important for us is that when we do decide to do something, when we do go on vacation, when we, when we pack it up and we drive somewhere, uh, or God forbid, uh, the idea of even trying to get on a plane with both kids right now scares me. Uh, but if we decide to take a vacation that requires us to fly somewhere, being good about letting that be a fun experience instead of letting the stress 
of trying to wrangle the kids overwhelm it uh, to a degree, uh, I think that's something that at least I need to work on because, man, we take vacations and vacations, the point of vacation is, is to de-stress. It's to feel good. It's to enjoy it. And often I find myself so on edge uh, when we take vacation because there's just so much to do and so many uh, variables with, with taking care uh, of both kids and their, their really divergent needs uh, that it can cut into actually enjoying the experience, which is why we're doing it in the first place. So that's what at least I know I need to work on. Um, and I think that we probably need to work on as, as a unit and a, and a family is enjoying our experiences. Yeah, so we'll just need to do some really deep meditation for like weeks up up until a trip is what you're saying. We need to like woosah it out. Either that or if you could just finally get that magic wand and mm. just make it work. I mean, I've been mm. asking for a long time. I think the teleporter would be handier. We could just throw the stuff in there right. and we wouldn't even have to pack it. Like that would be my ideal packing situation. Yeah. I feel like one of your friends should definitely invent a teleporter for us. Yeah. It would solve, it would solve everyone's problem. Yeah. Let's get on it, people. All right. Well, I love you so much. Thanks for just being one of the best advocates I know and um, for taking such good care of us and... I hope that uh, you can pass this episode along to uh, one of the favorite advocates in your life, too. And maybe they can see themselves a little in Casey. Well, thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, I love you all so, so much. And uh, I love taking care of all of you. And you three take care of me every day. All right. Thanks, darling. No problem. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate y'all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you.